Welcome! This tutorial will cover general issues people encounter while filling out FEMA's Elevation Certificate form. It is part of a broader how-to series focusing on FEMA's Elevation Certificates. More specifically, how CRS would like you to complete them. For a full list of videos in this series, see the video description below. This is part two of a training on general issues that come up with ECs in the CRS program. If you have not watched part one, that's okay. It is not needed to watch this segment, but be sure to go back and watch part one so you have a fuller understanding of all the issues that go with making sure FEMA elevation certificates are filled out completely and accurately. As a reminder from our other videos, these CRS EC training videos are primarily created for local officials who have to collect, review, and correct these forms so that they are correct for CRS purposes. Surveyors, engineers, and architects who are authorized by law to certify elevation information should also find these videos helpful. Let's continue on with the training in this video covering general issues part two. On all previous forms prior to 2015, section C and D were on the first page of the form. Starting with the 2015 form and continuing through the 2019 form, the format was spread out and sections C and D were moved to the second page. To reduce the possibility of altering the form, it was suggested that the surveyor should sign the first page. You can allow a surveyor to sign that first page, but it is not required for CRS purposes. Just make sure Section D is signed by the surveyor, engineer, or architect, or Section F is signed by the property owner or property owner's representative. And now we transition to page issues. We need to talk about addresses at the top of each page. With the 2012 form, sections A through D were all on one page, so unless you had a building in an unnumbered A zone with no BFE determined or an AO zone that only showed the flood depth, you did not have to include page 2 with your EC. If you did have a building in an unnumbered A zone or an AO zone, you did have to supply both pages and be sure the same address that was on the first page was at the top of the second page as well. Otherwise, it's not clear as to whether the information on page 2 is for the same building that's shown on page 1. Starting with the 2015 form and continuing with the 2019 form, the format of the form expanded and the main part of the form is now 4 pages long. Since section C and D are now on page 2, you must always submit at least the first two pages. If you have a building in an unnumbered A zone with no BFE determined or an AO zone, then you will have to submit page 3. If you as the local floodplain administrator make comments in section G on page 4, then you'll want to be sure you submit page 4. We could go through all the ways you could possibly have just pages 1 and 2, or just pages 1 and 3, or maybe pages 1 through 2 and 4, but it's always best to require all four pages. That way, you get a full form and there is no question as to whether a page is missing or not. For CRS purposes, if we see a form with only a couple of pages, we'll do our best to verify the information that we can, but if we are unsure about something or it really looks like an additional page was needed, it will be considered an error. So do everyone a favor, especially yourself, and require all four pages each time. Remember, a FEMA form is always the full form. Surveyors should be supplying the full form each time. And always remember to make sure the same address that's on page 1 is on the top of all subsequent pages. That way you and CRS is assured that these four pages are for the building identified on page 1. And one last thing to cover with page issues is that the 2015 form had three different versions to it as FEMA made changes. The second version was around for about three months, contained only three pages, and contained no section in which to place the address at the top of each page. Some surveyors wrote the address at the top of each page themselves. You can certainly do that, but know that CRS does not call it an error, specifically in this situation if they are left blank since the form did not provide a place for it. If a letter of map amendment, a LOMA, or a letter of map revision, a LOMAR, has been issued for a property and it impacts the building, not just the property, the letter date and case number should be placed in the comments area of section D. You see, in this case, the LOMA affects the property and shows that it should not be removed from the SFHA. In the second example, you see the LOMA is for the structure and it is to be removed from the SFHA. So the date of the letter and the case number should be written in the comments area of section D. If the surveyor doesn't do this, the floodplain administrator can add this information to the comments area of section G. 
Another fairly common situation with map changes is when a new firm supersedes an older firm during construction of the building, so that a different firm is effective from the time a building was permitted until construction is complete on it. We cover this situation in the Section B video, but let's go over it again here. Remember the rule for what firm information to place on the EC. Section B, where all map information is, must always be filled out using the current firm's information at the time the EC is signed and dated. This causes a little confusion for the certifier of the form when the flood zone or the BFE change during the period of construction. So here's how to handle that and how ECs need to be filled out in these situations. Looking back to the City of Orlando example from the Section B video in this series, and say the information in the left column is the firm information for Orlando at the time the building is permitted. The information in the right column is the firm information at the time the building was completed and the finished construction EC was signed and dated in 2018, right after the new June 20, 2018 firm took effect. You'll notice that the BFE went up with the new firm. This might mean the developer built the lowest floor at 89 feet to satisfy the BFE at the time of permitting, but now that a new firm is in effect and shows the BFE to be at 90, it looks like they have a compliance problem and will be charged much higher rates as a consequence. Here's how to show that on the EC to make sure both a compliance reviewer and an insurance agent gets the correct story. The current firm information at the time the finished construction EC was signed and dated goes in all the required fields in Section B. Be sure to also fill in B10 and B11. Then, in the Section D comments box, you would place all the firm information that was in effect at the time of permitting. Be sure the surveyor explains it and provides fields B1, B4, B5, B7, B8, and B9. Now the EC clearly shows that the building met all requirements at the time of permitting, and it shows the current firm information at the time the form was certified. What happens with an EC once your community annexes property? Let's say you're a community and your community number is 777001 and a house is built right outside your jurisdiction in 2018. In 2019, you annex that property. In B1, the EC should show the NFIP number of the community that annexed it, or whose jurisdiction it lies in. Also, if the map number for B4 is different, that should be changed too. This all hinges on whether you, as the annexing community, have a copy of that EC. You might if you have building and floodplain regulations just outside your jurisdiction, something like a one or two mile extraterritorial jurisdiction where you would have to approve a permit for them and therefore have a copy of the EC, getting the right community number on the EC ensures it will get the correct CRS discount once you change it. You just need to make sure you give a copy of this adjusted EC to the current homeowner for him or her to take to the insurance agent so they can get their proper discount too. A significant portion of CRS communities deal with construction in V zones. Let's talk about some of the issues we encounter with these situations. The first thing to know is that when there is a building in the V zone, CRS requires that both an EC and a V zone design certificate be obtained by the community. This brings up the question of whether we view them as one certificate or two separate ones when counting errors. Since both must be part of the permit record for the building, we view both of them together as one certificate for CRS purposes. So if there was an error on either one, it would ostensibly count as an error for both, or what ends up being an error for that address. Another issue is whether buildings undergoing substantial improvement need to get a V-Zone design certificate. V-Zone design certificates are typically produced before the building is constructed as a way to certify proper design of these buildings. But once it's built and now substantial improvement is planned, how do you address the V-Zone certificate? The answer is that a V-Zone certificate is always required so that an engineer can sign off on the improvements made, certify that there are breakaway walls if that's the case, and confirm that it's being designed properly. Numbers 5 and 6 near the top of the form do not need to be entered since the new engineer signing this form may not have this information and is only certifying the improvements or repairs. So, we will not count this as an error if the depth of anticipate scour or erosion and the embedment depth of pilings or foundation is not filled in. Remember, this is for substantial improvement only. And lastly, with V-Zones, openings sometimes become an issue. Let's take a look at land by the ocean, or Great Lake. And let's say you wanted to build a house by that body of water. Well, if you're in the VE zone, you elevate your house. 
And if you place an enclosure underneath that elevated floor, it must be constructed with breakaway walls. Since they are breakaway walls, no openings are required since the breakaway walls are designed to collapse once waves hit them, which theoretically means there is no real enclosure there. Now, if you are building this same house just outside the VE zone, back inland a little bit in the AE zone, and you are a community which requires V-zone design and construction standards in a portion of your AE zone, or what the NFIP calls the coastal A zone, even though your building standards say the enclosure underneath that elevated floor must be constructed with breakaway walls, because the building is in an A zone, openings must be required. So, even though you may have a V-Zone certificate that shows breakaway walls are used for the enclosure, openings will still have to be present and shown on your EC. Otherwise, this may become a compliance issue for you, especially when the floor of that enclosure is below the BFE. Conversely, let's say the builder adds the openings, and if the same engineer that did your V-Zone certificate is also certifying the EC and does not place the openings on the form in section A8 because he's assuming everything's all right with the breakaway walls, then this would be an error on your EC. Since there can be many errors on an EC, we cover how to correct them in a video called How to Correct an Elevation Certificate. Be sure to watch that video as well for the various ways you can fix any error you see on an EC. That concludes training on part two of general issues that come up with ECs in the CRS program. Please be sure to watch all other videos that we have at crsresources.org training to learn about how to fill out each section correctly and how to correct those ECs that have not been filled out correctly. And again, thanks for watching.